forward to the plan that we have um, for this evening. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Hornberg, and I work with the Beef Farmers of Ontario as the Producer Relations Specialist. And um, BFO is pleased to partner tonight um, to host this evening's session with the OBC and the Campbell Centre. Um, so we're really looking forward to the discussion tonight. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Derek Haley to chair this evening's event. And I'll just get you to unmute. Perfect. Uh, the old mute button. Yeah, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, my name is uh, Derek Haley. I'm a faculty member at OVC at the University of Guelph. And I want to start by thanking you all for, uh, for joining us this evening. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. Please note that we are recording the event. So be aware of your audio and, uh, and your video settings. And please remain on mute uh, unless you're asking a questions, uh, any questions. So feel free to type questions into the chat box uh, during uh, Dr. Moya's presentation, or uh, you can join us with audio and video at the end of the presentation. And we'll take as many questions as we can uh, at the end of the event, uh, sticking to the limitations that we have set aside uh, for this evening. Uh, now then, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Diego Moya. Uh, Diego's originally from Spain, and he completed his degree in veterinary medicine, and then he uh, pursued a PhD degree. And, and, and with that, he studied uh, feed additives and management strategies uh, as potential alternatives to growth promotants in beef production. About 10 years ago, Diego came to Canada for a postdoc training uh, position with uh, Karen Schwarzkopf Genswein uh, at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge. And there he studied a number of different things, including, uh, including feeding behavior patterns uh, and, uh, and our opportunity to use those for the early detection of, uh, of sick cattle. Then uh, more recently in 2018, Diego was hired as a faculty member at the Western College of Vet Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan, mm. uh, where he specializes in uh, beef cattle welfare and behavior. And his work there has, uh, has focused on analyzing cattle behavior to better identify prominent health disorders and, uh, and to help us uh, develop prevention strategies and, and tailored treatment protocols uh, for beef production. So with that now, we'll uh, turn it over uh, to Dr. Moya to present on the role of precision technologies in beef cattle production. Diego, welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight and, and show you some of the research that I have, I have done and mostly some of the technology that I have been using for the past few years as they have been very useful for my, for my research and for my work, trying to use those technologies to, in a more objective and automatic manner, analyze animal behavior. Let's see, where is my... Here it is. So for today, um, I this is the outline for the presentation. I thought in starting with some background on what these technologies are and what are they supposed to do and how they can be used for the benefit of the beef industry. And then hopefully we can relate that to the next couple of um, topics as how those technologies can be used. I try to divide it into the within the beef industry into the cow calf sector and the feedlot sector, mostly because there are different approaches to those two different um, um, sections of, sectors of the industry. Um, so I will talk first about how technologies apply to the pasture and grazing management, and then precision livestock farming in confined spaces, meaning in a more controlled environment within a livestock environment, in a feedlot environment. And then we will end up with talking about the limitations of these technologies and some conclusions. So starting with uh, the background of these technologies, um, basically the, if I were to define what these are, is basically equipment aimed to automatic and in a real time, and monitoring animal behavior, health productivity, and the environmental impact. So basically it's a new set of eyes on your animals um, 24 seven that can get new information or the same information in a more accurate or objective objective manner 
and ask for this information to be utilized and to optimize the way these animals are handled and the productivity of these animals and their welfare. Um, this technology can be applied or the information we get can be at the, from the group level, but when talking about precision technologies, we are mostly talking about information collected from individuals. So moving from uh, managing information from the health level to the individual level as to better identify um, and manage the variability of these individuals within the, within the herd. Also, these technologies could be static, meaning that they you set them up in a specific place in your farm and they are not meant to be moved, or you, there are some that you can move them around and there are some other technologies that actually are um, equipped, the animals are equipped with this technology, they are wearable devices that the animals will um, take wherever they are and they are collecting the information in real time and sending that information to a computer that can process that information for the farmer. There's another section within the precision lines of farming technologies, which is the robotics, um, which are devices meant to automatize um, human handling on these animals, basically milking, feeding or cleaning the pen. Um, I'm not gonna touch on those uh, in this presentation as I haven't worked a lot with them, nor my knowledge on those are, is, very, is very broad, but just for you to know that there are some other area within precision life technologies that will deal with robotics as well. The other thing to, I want to start saying is that, unfortunately, when they asked me to put this presentation together, they um, advised me that this is gonna be, there are gonna be some producers in this, in the audience. So ideally I would like to make this from a more practical standpoint and let you know more practical information on how to use these technologies. But unfortunately, most of the technologies are being developed and used in the dairy, by the dairy, dairy industry. And not a lot of those technologies can be readily applied to the beef industry right away. Um, basically, these technologies have been developed to detect mostly estrus in, in, dairy, in the dairy industry. Although there's some potential still, and we're gonna talk about that and how to utilize that information within the beef industry, mostly to detect calving or sick animals. They are based on the same um, parameters. They, they are mostly capturing the behavior of the animals and how this behavior is uh, affected by uh, estrus in the case of the, the industry, but also by diseases or by calving. And those can also be detected by, by these uh, technologies. The other thing to consider here are that the logistics between the dairy and the beef industry are pretty much different uh, and in, from the point that in the dairy animals are being handled every day, twice or three times per day. And we know where they are all the time and they can come to a specific location, in this case for the milk parlor. And these uh, devices can upload information there. So everything is, in a perfect environment as for these devices to work. While in the beef industry, we have the cow calf sector where animals are mostly out in pasture. So there's not a lot of devices that you can set up in a specific location as to monitor their behavior or um, the price of these technologies is not cheap enough as for the margins in which the beef industry is working these days can afford and to use these technologies and to pay for these technologies. So these are the different uh, scenarios and conditions that uh, prevent these technologies to be um, translated right away from the dairy industry to the beef industry. And other things to consider when you are thinking on using these technologies in the beef industry are also the return of investment. As I said, the price of these technologies are still quite expensive and this, this is why one of, one of the reasons why they are not being uh, uptaken by the beef industry as much as by the dairy industry. Um, and also the life cycle as well. Um, beef animals last uh, less in the farm uh, compared to dairy cows and that it has to be taken into account. And in terms of whether the, these devices can be 
and reuse for different animals or actually how long do we expect them to to be useful at the farm as well so when talking about the benefits or the potential benefits of introducing these technologies in the beef industry i put them together in these three main areas animal welfare sustainable production and labor efficiency i'm going to talk briefly about these three components from an animal welfare standpoint um, the evaluation and management of animal welfare has evolved in the last um, decade and it's no longer acceptable to manage animal welfare at the herd level or we are moving towards being more precise about how individual animals within that farm are performing and how they are coping with their environment and this is going to get more specific in the in the future and the evaluation of animal welfare is going to consider more and more parameters animal based measurements no longer farm based uh, evaluations and we need to have more objective evaluations and that will help us to better inform the decisions on how this welfare has to be um, managed in the farms so we need these technologies to develop and to use these objective parameters to better assess animal welfare in the future and this is going to be in the next 10 20 years it's going to be probably mandatory for um, and being part of these certification levels and the beef industry when they uptake these uh, new parameters and these new evaluations on animal welfare are going to benefit from having an increased public confidence on the way animals are being handled and the way food and meat is being produced in Canadian farms. Also, these farms that uptake these technologies can probably have access to a market premium because they have an objective evaluation of individual animal welfare in their farms. And also, they can probably grant them some access to international markets where these uh, welfare evaluations are already in place or they may be um, implemented in the next years. The second area or the second um, component for which uh, precision technologies could be good for uh, is because um, the demand for beef meat uh, is either steady or increasing uh, depending on the country and it's going to stay that way the trend is that, uh, like that for the next 15 years at least and the way Canada and the beef, Canadian beef industry is going to cope with that demand is going to be probably not by increasing the amount of animals, but um, rather increasing the productivity of the existing uh, animals that we have uh, nowadays. And to maximize that genetic uh, potential that animals have, we could use these technologies to maximize the reproductive success, success to optimize pasture management, management, and as well as feed efficiency in, in feedlots. Um, we're talking about as I mentioned before, instead of uh, managing the herd or, or a population at the herd level, instead of going to a more individualized way of doing that and uh, optimize the way that the animals that are towards the left side of this um, population, let's say those animals that cope uh, poorly with the conditions to boost their efficiency. And also for those animals that have the genetic potential to become better and more efficient to help them achieve that potential and not be being dragged out by the by the average group and also these technologies are going to help us to better utilize antimicrobials and to target the vaccine programs and to target health um, management and to better identify diseases and before clinical signs become apparent to the human eye these devices have the potential to pick up deviations um, of individual animals um, at that early stage. So these antimicrobials can be used early on in the, in, the, in the disease process and they can become more efficient and you potentially have to use less as these animals are less likely to become chronic, chronic um, and you have to use less uh, antimicrobials in these animals. So sort of different things that the individual management of, of the animals in the, in the farm can allow you to 
optimize the productivity of, of the farm. And then the last component will be on labor efficiency. Um, along with what we have mentioned before, uh, operations are getting larger um, related to the profit margins that the beef industry is working with. And they have to become larger and have more animals in the farm to have a better income for the farm. That along with the, I don't know if you call it a crisis, but a lower amount of um, people that is able or willing to work in the farm. And so you put those together, larger farm with less people involved and working with cattle that potentially can cause some problems in, in the future in creating or in identifying or handling the animals properly. So these technologies can help you with that in becoming more efficient using less people to better manage a larger amount of animals. So that was uh, all the background or preliminary information that I wanted to share with you on precision technologies. And then we're gonna start talking about more in specific technologies or devices and how this can be applied to these different scenarios, starting with the pasture and grazing management. This is a wide a range of uh, information and publications and even uh, technologies that can, you can find in the market for precision agriculture and how to manage grasslands and, and pastures. Um, I don't have a lot of information about those technologies, nor I have worked with those in the past. So I just wanted to share with you some of the potentially, um, some of the potential parameters that you can evaluate with those uh, regarding the soil properties, and the, utilize those technologies to, for precision seeding, for smart irrigation and fertilization systems, and to determine um, or determine herbage biomass. So you, there's a whole lot of technologies and devices up there to use in this uh, specific uh, scenario. But today, for today's talk, I decided that I will talk mostly about those devices used for, um, for especially for the animals. So regarding grazing management, um, basically what we want is to optimize how the forest production and the number of animals are, are allocated. So for that, I'm gonna talk about different technologies that allow you to control where animals are grazing. And then also some technologies to evaluate how much these animals are actually grazing. And again, some of the pictures you're gonna find that they are, they have dairy cows in it, and mostly because some of these have been developed for um, thinking on the dairy industry. But that doesn't mean that when you consider your specific farm and your particular situation, you might find some of these technologies useful for your for your purposes. For example, these automatic gates on the left, where in this case animals are getting out of the milk parlor, and you can decide. Um, where they are going to, to graze that day. And um, potentially this could be adapted um, in a pasture for the beef industry as well. If you have different areas that you want to graze um, at different times of the year. So you can um, make that decision or make that control more automatic rather than moving the animals up and down in the pasture. Similarly on the right, this time remote gate release devices. Basically it's a, an electric fence that has a timer and this can be released at a specific time or you can control that from the uh, remotely and this can be a trigger and this thing disappears. Um, and then cows have access to a new set of or a new pasture um, that they have been before. The other thing to control grazing activity is virtual fencing. And probably you have heard about this uh, from a long time ago, um, at least for the last 10 years. This technology has been there. There are different publications testing and evaluating how useful they are. The concept is basically a GPS um, and animals are wearing this GPS on them. You can then set up an app on your phone to let them let the GPS know where you want these animals to be. Um, and then if the, if the animals get closer to the virtual fence, they will hear a sound and they are over a training period, they're 
train to avoid that sound and get away from that particular area, in this case, the fence that you want them to avoid. And after a, a training period, the animals will stay in that particular area that you set up on the phone. And then the advantage is that you can change that area at your will, um, and the animals will be moving around based on these sounds. Um, these have been in place for a long time. The latest uh, advantage that these are providing is that now they have these uh, solar panels, as you can see here in the pictures. So now they are powered um, all the time. So it is an advantage to earlier versions that they had to be charged. And the amount of signals that they will, the GPS could do and communicate with the satellite will be very limited based on the battery life of these devices. Now, as it is solar and powered, and then you don't have that limitation anymore. And they are also they are getting smaller and lighter, so that's another advantage for the future. And again, if you are considering that this could be something that you might want to use, and um, be aware of your farm logistics, whether you are actually you have the need of moving the animals around or changing the fences several times within a year, whether that's something that you already do, or whether that's something that will cause an advantage for your farm. Also be aware of the accuracy of these devices. Um, I have mixed experiences in the past. Earlier versions were not that accurate. They were saying that up to seven meters of accuracy, but my, the, the experience that I had is that actually I could have read up to 50 meters away from where the animal was actually, or actually was. So they weren't that great in that sense. Now I will say, and my last experiences with that is that they are becoming much better at at being more accurate uh, within the range that you want them to be. The other thing to consider is the training period. And these animals, there are some animals that inevitably are not going to understand the relationship between the acoustic sound and whether you want them to get away from there. So maybe that doesn't work for all the animals in your farm. So that's something to consider. Also, then the cost, as, as always, and how much it is to to maintain these devices and to have the to have them serviced regularly in case of mal malfunction, and then maybe not for virtual fencing itself, but you can consider using these GPS devices for studying or analyzing how much they move your cattle in the pasture and whether this mobility is compromised by some disease process on the animal. So you might want to um, consider that for that purpose alone. Also to consider or to study how much visits to the water or the mineral block your animals are having when they are out in the pasture. And also for security purposes, whether the animals are actually getting out of the of your of your pasture. Um, the alternative to GPSs could be drones, um, which they don't depend on the communication with a satellite, but rather one device that you can control. From a, from a distance, they have quite a, a long range, uh, so you can drive the, the drone around your, your farm. And the, the thing is that instead of an individual control, you have a control over what the drone is looking at. So you can look at the different animals in the pasture, but you won't know, unless the drone is flying automatically at the specific times, you won't know what all the animals are doing uh, during the whole day. But for, for example, for checking the fence of your, of your property, for looking for cows or whether to see from a distance whether a cow is calving or there's any difficulties with the calving process, to see how the pasture is doing uh, over the summer. And what I'm gonna tell you today about is for research as well. It has been useful for, my, for one of the projects that I have done in the past. We're doing a, a research on uh, mob grazing, and we are evaluating different uh, combinations of legumes and grasses varieties. I wanted to see their performance and persistence, but also how they will uh, perform uh, with an intensive grazing uh, system, such as the mob, mob grazing. And one of the things that we want to study is whether these different varieties and different combinations, what will be the grazing preference of a herd of grazing cattle. So here's uh, one of the videos that we captured. So you're gonna see, or maybe later you're gonna be 
better identify. We have different strips of uh, forages, and we have 20 different combinations of monocultures and binary mixtures of legumes and, and grasses. I think here you can see it better. We have three replicated blocks, again, with different combinations of legumes and grasses. Um, I wanted to see one of the things that we want to evaluate is the grazing preference. How much time these cows will spend in each individual uh, strip, um, and which means in each individual forage. And for that, we use the drone to capture that information. We also have, in case of the drone wasn't working or there was too much wind, we also have a, a car driving by and collecting that same information. But the drone in this case was useful, at least to get these um, cool videos for presentations, I would say. But yeah, for this, also for studying, we have some of these animals were wearing a label. It's because we categorize the animals between also between being more exploratory or more shy to see whether that different temperament or different behavior will make them um, have different preference in the in the field. And the results, what we saw, this is a part of a thesis from Cassidy Sim, and she's actually working on that um, these days. But the preliminary results is that cattle actually showed some preference towards specific um, forages and more specifically legume monocultures, such as the, these different vari varieties of alfalfa, um, as opposed to different combinations with different grasses. And one of the limitations of this study is that um, they were all seeded at the same time. So when we took this, uh, analyzed this data, um, different forages will have different stages of maturity. So animals will probably choose depending on the yield and, and the stage of maturity of these um, different forages. And actually when we find the correlations between the resin preference and some of the nutritive, uh, nutritive value of these forages, we saw that the animals will um, have a positive correlation between the preference and the dry matter yield, the crude protein or different variations of how protein is analyzed and they will select against the amount of fiber in these forages. But anyway, just an example on how, in this case, we use drones to analyze grazing preference in, in cattle. <clears throat> so that was about measuring or controlling grazing activity in the pasture. The other component will be to actually measure how much feed they are eating and to make sure, measure grazing intake. This has been a challenge for the last um, several years as uh, because traditional method, methods often are limited to research purposes uh, in a small plots and with a limited amount of animals. And the equations that we can start from that usually can overestimate or underestimate the, the realities. Also, they omit biodiversity because it's hard to work with um, a pasture where you have, you have different varieties of forages uh, inside. And then also the, most of them, they are tedious, expensive, time consuming. And in summary, they are not very practical for uh, analyzing grazing intake in continuous grazing systems. So here's another example of how these precision technologies could actually uh, provide us with the opportunity to use them to evaluate a new set of parameters, in this case, grazing intake, and to use that information to our advantage to better optimize the efficiency of grazing cattle in this case. A few examples of these technologies could be these uh, pressure sensitive sensors, these bands around the mouth that are capturing the pressure of the animals as they are biting and chewing. And then you can extrapolate or correlate that movement of the mouth with how much feed they, they ingested. Uh, different version here with a pendulum uh, in, as a, in a collar. So the more movements is captured by this pendulum. You can correlate that with more bites and more grazing activity and hence more intake. Here's an example of an equation that these devices could uh, help us to build. Um, the thing is, the problem is that these are very limited on how this can be used, these equations can be used. Meaning that 
these are very specific to these animals that were evaluated in this specific, with this specific forage, with this specific um, phenological stages. And then it is hard to use the same equation for different scenarios where you have a more diverse pasture, different animals with different ages and different soil structures. So it shows you that there is the potential to use these technologies to measure intake, but in reality, we're still far away from using these devices and, and accurately measure intake in a wide range of scenarios. Another approach would be to measure the sounds that the animals are doing as they uh, chew and they bite these forages, such as with a microphone and a recorder, or these rumination collars that were developed and to measure uh, rumination activity. Again, try to build then after that algorithms or equations to extrapolate these movements with grazing intake. Here's an, an attempt that I made in combining sounds and the use of accelerometers with sheep in this case. And hopefully you are, you can hear something. But what I wanted, what I wanted to try is the combination of the acoustics and the movement of the head will give me a better, um, better information or more accurate information on how sheep were eating, and then in the future uh, use this information for um, dressing animals. Diego, if I can interrupt just for a second, we can't yeah. actually hear the audio. I'm not sure if there are other options for you to try, whether you're using headphones that you might know, be... I'm not using headphones, but anyway, it doesn't matter. You saw yes, it was you. The, the sound wave of the of the thing. And basically, I wanted to say that I combine and um, I use the sounds that they were producing along with the movements of the head as to better capture when they were actually eating or not. And then from there, trying to extrapolate with how much feed they were eating. Um, and these are work in progress. Um, but just to say, to say that the combination of different technologies, sometimes it's better and provide better results um, than one alone. And the final piece of technology for cow-calf um, uh, operations will be these uh, calving detectors and different devices that some of them are gonna talk later because they are wearable devices, such as accelerometers and both in the ear or in the neck, room and boluses and pedometers. This device capturing and the temperature and this one, this one as well. And all of them trying to capture changes either in temperature or movement of the animal that can be correlated with um, calving. And you, this has been, again, this has been developed for dairy cows mostly because then you can read these devices every day. And out in the pasture, maybe you don't have an antenna that is which range can actually read these devices um, constantly. So that's why they might not work as well. But in the future, hopefully technology can get better at it. And, and this the same technology can actually be applied for the cow calf industry um, with beef cattle. The, last, the second or the third section in this case will be this technology is used for um, livestock farming in confined spaces. Before we had the limitation of these devices having to record the data and store it and then waiting for the precise moment that they are either by the water trough or a specific location in the pasture where this data can be actually sent to the computer. When we are dealing with animals in a pen, in a feedlot, and that is um, a little easier to, to manage. And then we have similar technologies such as these accelerometers. They are like ear tags that have attached an accelerometer that can read and store information that can be linked to, for example, eating. So how much time they spend eating or ruminating or the amount of activity, in this case, walking activity, or even temperature. In this case, the quantified AG can also read uh, temperature. And this one even has a light that if there is something wrong going, going on with this animal can turn on the light so you can better identify it 
are, uh, are in the pen. So different technologies to capture the behavior of the animals and compare that to either uh, an industry standard or a, a farm level standard and identify deviations that can red flag for the farmer whether there's something wrong or possibly some, something going wrong with the animals. These devices typically they are between 150 and $300 per device plus all the logistics around the antennas and the transmission for these devices. So again, that's why the uptake by the beef industry is a little more limited, but it is there, it is commercially available and it works. It's just up to the different circumstances of the farmer to decide whether that is providing you with a solution or with more headaches actually. An example on how I use these accelerometers for my, in this case, for my benefits, for my research, we do have this behavior on cattle or on, on calves that is called tail-free behavior that has been linked to discomfort, pain, and stress of animals in different scenarios, whether that is because of the high density of flies or because of the um, pain during castration or after castration or this budding. And we do know that calves tend to move their tail uh, quite a lot when they are under discomfort or feeling pain. Um, the only way we have to assess that was uh, with a visual assessment, is recording videos or being there in real time and recording number of tail flicks, which is time consuming and, and, and very exasperating um, can be. So I thought that maybe if we attach an accelerometer to the tail, we could have this measure in a more objective and automatic manner. So you're gonna see here the visual observation, which is used as the gold standard. And then here, the raw reading from the accelerometer and, and the video, you can, you can watch it on the top. So you have there the cow moving the tail and we set up three accelerometers at different locations of the tail. And you have here the orange line will be whether there was a recording for a tail flick or not based on the visual observation. And down you have the readings from the accelerometer. And in this case, a three axis accelerometer. So it gives you reading in the three axis of movement. And once we have that, then we have to find out which are the thresholds that we can use to correlate or to better correlate the accelerometers with the visual observation. And for that, I just want to show you all the different iterations that I went through and to how to process the data to better correlate that with the, our gold standard, which again, it was the, goal, the visual observation. In the end, I found that the readings from the accelerometer were highly correlated with the readings from the visual observation. Mostly when you put the accelerometer uh, close to the tail switch and when you discard all the movements below the 80th percentile. So basically you only consider the top 20th percentile of movements of the accelerometer. If you do that, then you can save time instead of watching the videos of tail flicks, just um, put the accelerometer and you have the same information. And I use that uh, with an, another trial that was going on with castrated calves. And actually I saw that after castration, the amount of movement captured by the accelerometers was actually higher than before castration. So again, validating that uh, thing. Um, whether you can use that in the farm and to assess discomfort or pain in your cattle, um, that will be up to this specific technology to be um, handled properly as to animals having this accelerometer in the tail, whether that is uh, something viable in the long term or not, whether it's something that you could do for a brief period of time to evaluate the welfare of your animals. It's just a um, new set of tools that you can use in the future probably. You also have um, available, and they are, these are commercially available devices that you can find and buy, and rumen boluses that will give you information on the rumen pH, um, which could be linked to um, digestive upsets such as uh, acidosis in, in the feedlot industry. It can give you also drinking activity, which can be correlated with also eating activity, but Generally, it tells you whether the animal is eating properly or not. Also, give you temperature, can be linked to uh, having fever or not and identifying disease processes. And also, it can give you activity because it also has 
Other than a pH meter, it also has a, an accelerometer. So it can give you overall activity of the animal and whether this activity or temperature crosses specific thresholds, it can red flag the animals as being problematic. The other technology that we can use is to evaluate uh, animal location in the farm. And again, this is an example on a dairy, um, in a dairy farm, but you can imagine this can be translated in a field pen, for example, to assess where all your animals are, not only for the sake of understanding their behavior, but also to identify standing and laying behavior, because this is actually very accurate. It has an accuracy of up to 30 centimeters, which is much more, much better than the GPS. So you can understand standing and laying behavior, and that can be linked to discomfort of the animals or some diseases going on. It can give you information on the social interactions with different animals in the pen. And uh, all this information can be utilized to provide a, a welfare assessment in your animals. Now, the problem with these sensors, as you can imagine, they are quite expensive. And um, for a pen, I would say for a feedlot pen of 200 animals, it could go for $40,000 $40, maybe for the pen. So maybe you can use just the one pen as a, as a over information of your farm or wait until hopefully these technologies get cheaper and, and they are actually more readily available for the beef industry. There are some of these sensors that not only give you the location, but also because it has an accelerometer, it can give you also fumination activity and overall activity of the animals. So it's another combination of different technologies that can optimize the information that you get. And then there is, there are those sensors that are not um, born by the animals, but rather you can install them in your farm and, and have some individual readings. And um, first, and yeah, this is not even a dairy cow, uh, this is a, a, a mouse, because I want to show you the, how good it can get this technology. The, in this case, we're talking about uh, video tracking uh, or video monitoring animals. These animals don't have any marker or anything like that. It's just the video identifying the animal because of the contrast between the, the color of the animal and the, and the background. And it can identify the location of the animal and even the activity. When you translate that uh, technology that seems so cool and, and so good to the, to the cattle, you have something like this where this case, the number 100 is how confident the system is that this is a cow. Um, but as you can see here, for example, there is two cows being identified in, in it's actually only one. This one, this one cow is now by the system is three cows in one. And um, one is now the wall is becoming a, a cow now. So anyway, it's just not very efficient just because in real conditions, the background is not as, um, doesn't provide the contrast as for the system to capture the animals in real time. So it doesn't work that well, but that doesn't mean that in the future, this could be further optimized. Again, an example with a mouse and how this, this technology could even capture the activity of the animal, not only the location, but also what the animal is doing based on the shape of the animal or, or the, the silhouette of the animal, better say. And it can classify the behavior of the animals and this is something that I'm actually working on with this company, OneCap, on trying to bring that technology to the beef industry and having a camera per pen that will tell you location and activity of the animals without having to wear any uh, accelerometer or any antenna or anything like that. Um, it would be much cheaper if this could be accurately validated. Um, an example of a study where I use um, not that specific technology, but the use of videos to analyze the behavior of animals. In this case, when trying to use or to assess whether the injection of lidocaine immediately before or 90 seconds before castration would cause or will provide any benefit to the animals in terms of mitigating the pain caused by castration. So we have two groups, the one with lidocaine and one without lidocaine. And we have this an example of the videos that we're recording. And we have an observer looking at 
the individual behaviors of the carbs. In this case, examples of things that we look at are tail flicks, as I mentioned before, how much movement of the tails. In this case, the group with lidocaine was showing a reduced number of tail flicks, also reduced number of foot stamps, also linked to pain and discomfort. And also the standing and laying behavior was having a profile that was more compatible with animals having less pain. So an example on how the use of, or the study of animal behaviors will give information on the stress and, and pain of your, of your animals. And these same animals then were moved from that pen to the pasture in three different, three different stages. And we're, we wanted to capture the mobility of the calves, whether the lidocaine will improve the mobility of these calves. For that, we used this drone. We were moving both uh, the cow and the calf from one pen to another one and then to the, to the pasture. And we evaluate how long it took for these calves to reach the final goal. And for, with lidocaine, it took less time. So they were moving uh, faster. And also the distance between the cow and the calf was also shorter with the lidocaine. So again, suggesting that the use of lidocaine in this case, even though we didn't have to wait for the prescribed five or 10 minutes to have effect, it already made some effect in terms of improving the mobility of the calves and reducing the signs of pain. Uh, and I'm looking at the watch and I'm getting close to the, how much time do I have, Derek? Um, you know, we should end up, uh, if we start at about five after seven uh, Eastern, we should finish up about five after eight. So if you've got a few more minutes, if you okay. could entertain so, some questions, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. So okay. yeah, I will try to finish the presentation in the next uh, five minutes. Um, just with a few more examples on how I used in the past uh, video cameras in this case. And this is something that um, Karen Schwarzhoff, Dr. Schwarzhoff Genswin in Lethbridge, uh, along with uh, Dr. Yelinski here at the, in Saskatchewan, we're working on trying to develop an automatic system to evaluate cattle lameness. Um, so in this case, it will be something like this. You have a camera recording from the side and it will automatically detect without the need of any marker, the speed at which each hoof is moving, the angles of the, of the leg and the conformation as to detect very early stages of lameness and hopefully prevent those lameness to get any worse. Then maybe you have here as well, the use of 3D cameras for body condition score. I don't, I haven't found any marketed technology on this on this sense. Um, but basically it will, say it will be a 3D camera that will look at the conformation of the animal and give you a body condition score automatically. Again, I think this has been working for the for a lot of years and there must be something going on with this that doesn't, maybe it's not that accurate. Um, there are also some people working on looking at the faces and of animals and correlate that with uh, pain and based on the expressions and the facial expression of the animals. So again, if you could in the future put a camera by the, by the water trough or by the feed bank and look at these faces and early identify pain in cattle, that would be the ideal scenario, but still something on, on, on the works. Infrared cameras, similar thing. Um, you could identify fever or stress depending on the changes in the temperature. Also inflammation, we have been working when, when doing with castration. And when doing castration trials, we're looking using these cameras to evaluate inflammation. Um, different technologies that they exist, they have a point, they have a, a potential, but when you bring them to a real scenario, it's not that easy to make them work. Um, I have tried several of those and, and they are gonna take some time until they actually have a, like a marketed product and readily available. I think I'm gonna skip this um, section on monitoring feed intake. Basically, there are different technologies to measure how much intake individual animals within a herd um, are having from uh, feed banks on top of weight loads that um, they can measure how much feed is disappearing and reading the antenna so they can know what animals 
what animal is in the feed bank and how much feed is disappearing. Uh, other ones that they have the same principle, but only one animal at a time can get into the, into the feed bank or just uh, an antenna that can tell you whether the animal is at the feed bank or not. These are different approaches to measure individual feed intake. I'm gonna skip this and this. And then I think this is the final device. The working with acoustic information. Uh, I'm working this day with this whisper on arrival. It's basically an stethoscope that you put it by the side of the animal, by the ribs, and it gives you a read on the lungs. And it has an algorithm that automatically detects the sounds of the lungs and it tells you whether the animal is has chronic BRD or bovine respiratory disease, or is severe acute or normal, can give you an idea on how the health of these lungs is. I'll skip that too. Just to finish with the limitations and conclusions of these technologies. Um, the limitations that, and probably you already are aware of this, but over the last 10 years of my career, I have seen products that seems to see seems to be the the gold solution for everything, but then you see that after a couple of years they disappear, or they the companies have been absorbed by a bigger company, and maybe the product is slightly changed, or they have to work on the algorithm again. So it's it's hard to track which ones are actually which of these technologies are actually readily available and products that you can go to the market and buy and use, and which ones are actually just a promise of a good idea with good potential, but it's still not quite there yet. And it's hard to distinguish between which ones are the good ones and which not. Also, most of these technologies, although there is a machine reading and capturing the information, in the end, the information is being processed based on an algorithm that has been uh, human made with the assumptions and the limitations that this have. So maybe some of these technologies work perfectly in one partic particular scenario, but they might not work as well in another environment. Also, some technologies trying to tell you that they are the definitive answer for everything, but that is rarely the case. And, um, Typically, the best solution is to combine different technologies as to get the more comprehensive and optimal information. And then you find that the readings from one technology are not compatible with the other one. So we have to work on uh, third party um, softwares or programs that can actually integrate information captured by different devices and give it to the farmer in a more, um, in a better way as to better identify the problems at the farm. And another limitation could be the over-reliance on, on these technologies can actually limit the amount of time that humans spend with animals and can lead to some problems being overseen uh, over the long period of time. And then finally, the limitation is that most of the technologies have a lot of or require a lot of training and a lot of understanding of how they work. And even if they stop working, you might have to have a plan B in place and as not for the whole thing to collapse. And that is requires more technical expertise and more training on, on the personnel of your farm to understand how this operate. I think that's it as a conclusion um, look at what are the questions or what are the problems that you want to solve? And then really do an analysis on whether the technologies available will actually provide you with a solution or whether it will cause you to have more questions about your, your particular farm. And, and then for not being too pessimistic, I'm confident that new technologies and or the existing technologies in the near future are gonna be better adapted for the scenario of for the for the beef industry and I'm going to keep analyzing them and using them and covering the next few years I can come back and tell you which ones are um, good to be used right away
And that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Diego. Uh, great, great presentation. What a lot of uh, opportunities there are there, and yeah, certainly challenges are there as there are in, in any in any um, new endeavor. Um, we've got some questions that came into the chat earlier that I'd like to dive right into, and uh, the first one is is from Dan Ferguson, and his comment is that lameness is a concern for our feedlot sector. Uh, do we have do we have let's say let do we have technology available? Uh, that can work in our Canadian conditions to try and help us identify lameness. I modified that question somewhat. He asked specifically about infrared, but maybe there are other technologies that are available as well. Um, infrared, you said, I'm not aware of infrared technologies use. Well, yeah, and they're having these infrared technologies for measuring inflammation at the hoof level. The problem with infrared technology is that Depending is very dependent on the environmental temperature, so depends where you have the camera. And um, also, typically, um, beef cattle are not being processed through the same location on a daily basis as to have uh, the same reading over and over and capture those lameness at an early stage. And the thing that I'm working with, um, as I said in the presentation, is with um, cameras and see whether are the animals are moving towards the shoot maybe, or uh, they're moving um, to the feed bank, if cameras will actually track and triangulate the, and identify those lameness um, before they even they are apparent to the human eye. I, can, I cannot say that there is any technology that I'm aware of that is already available to do that, um, but rather that we are working on it and hopefully in the next few years we can have that ready for, for the industry. Okay, thank you. And you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna give the second question to Dan as well because I thought he asked another really good question here, and that had to do with vocalization. And he said vocalization is a key indicator of cattle welfare that can be overlooked by a lot of producers. Are there tools to monitor how cattle complain? Um, yeah, another thing. There is nothing in the market available for that, but in the in the pig industry, there and I think also in the the poultry industry, they're already using that for, as he said, uh, capturing the vocalization of the animals. And they have been correlated with um, their level of stress or discomfort. And um, for the beef industry, again, the problem is that with pigs, with dairy, they are all very confined in smaller spaces uh, compared to a field lot where you have multiple pens. So it's a matter of putting multiple microphones in its pen and capturing that information. Um, it's something that, again, and I, I'm afraid most of my answers are gonna be like that. It's something that is um, being developed, is uh, an approach that um, we are working on, but there is nothing out there yet that can be readily, readily available. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next question is from Katie Wood and she, uh, she writes into the chat, great presentation, Dr. Moya, and I Thank agree. You. In teaching undergraduate students in livestock production, are there any key skills uh, that should be teach that we should be teaching our future farmers and in industry in terms so they're ready and set for precision agriculture? Yeah, I would say the biggest skill would be to be skeptic or critic about what they can the information they can find they can they can find in the in the internet or in, in different conferences, because I have had many experiences where these uh, companies, they they typically oversell their, their product or they try to overachieve what they can actually do. So if you can teach these farmers or students to understand how actually these technologies work, they will better understand the limitations of the technologies as well. So when they tell you that we have an accelerometer that can capture uh, feed intake, well, now you know that, okay, they might work capturing the movement of the ears or the position of the head. And this might have an algorithm that you can relate that to feed intake, but then you can identify already within this process, what are the weak points of that technology? And then hopefully have a better prepare or have, make a better informed decision on whether this technology is actually good for, for you or not. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a question from a researcher, a PhD candidate, uh, former, former Guelph graduate, uh, Rachel Emily Kuhn, and she asked the question, she's saying here, I currently use multiple wireless technologies, SCR and SmaxTech, <laughs> in my research in a feedlot, and I have problems with radio interference between the two systems. Oh. And obviously that's a potential um, hiccup for trying to use some of these. She, uh, she asks, is this a common problem and have you heard of any solutions for that? Um, I, I never encountered that problem, but I don't think I ever worked with two um, technologies that are working wireless at the same time. So I am aware of, for example, the one that I show on the, the ultra wide band sensor that it has an ear tag that measures the location of the animals. I know that I have had some problems with the metallic fences as they act as a, as a wall or as a blind spot for this communication with the devices. So th those are problematic. As to how to solve that, probably is within the limitations that I said, sometimes or most of the times these uh, technologies, they are not prepared to work along with other technologies. So um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bad spot um, that you are on. Um, I don't know if they can change the frequency at which these devices work uh, on demand. I don't know if, if they could do that for a research scenario as, as hers, but but yeah, this is one of the limitations that these technologies oftentimes, they made them on purpose not compatible with others just to capture uh, the market for themselves probably. Great, and uh, and Dan Ferguson had another very interesting question here, I think, and uh, it's in reference to the uh, whisper on arrival, if I'm not mistaken, that you were talking about towards the end of your presentation. And yeah. Dan asks, do you ever see an incentive to scan for BRD, for example, possibly for 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 premium sales? <clears throat> well, the the benefit that I see for that is more towards well, in two aspects. One would be when the animals arrive. Um, I can see that you better identify which animals are at higher risk of developing the disease. You can hopefully um, develop a more tailored health management program and uh, you can do a better use of antimicrobials, which now is not a big problem right now, but maybe in the future, the industry doesn't have this uh, availability for using metaphylatic antimicrobials. So maybe starting to learn how to use these technologies to prevent BRD to happen will be a good thing. And the other one would be once you pull the animals to, again, to better evaluate the exact moment or the exact health status of these animals, whether the animals are getting at, at an earlier stage and they are getting um, sicker or whether they are um, getting better already. So these technologies can give you a better idea what antimicrobial will be um, better to be used. And again, when you are using the antimicrobials in a more efficient way, hopefully you can reduce the use of antimicrobials that could give you an advantage in um, towards some specific market. Okay, thank you. And that covers, I guess, uh, at this point, unless I'm mistaken, uh, Jacqueline or Elena about uh, the questions that have come into the chat. Folks, feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and ask another question if you have one. Um, otherwise, you're still free to type the questions into the chat. And if we don't get to them here this evening as we're kind of coming around to our one hour uh, timeframe for the webinar, we can certainly give those to uh, Diego and have him reply to you on the side. Uh, just a reminder about this, uh, this event having been recorded, we will send a link to that recording on YouTube. It will be on the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare's YouTube page, YouTube channel, I guess. And uh, we will send a link around to all of you and to those who registered but weren't able to make it here this evening uh, so that you can view this again. Uh, certainly there was a huge number of opportunities and technologies there that we could take advantage of. And I think whether they're 
applied immediately in terms of productivity, there's still some very interesting research tools to help the industry. Uh, just think of those examples that you were citing about painful procedures. And we all know that it's hard to detect pain in, 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 in cattle and other species. And you know, having that kind of technology that will help us develop protocols to mitigate pain for these things and, and get even, even better protocols, uh, I think is, is, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah, so. I, I, I try to make it more oriented toward the industry, but yeah, for the, definitely for researchers and for research purposes, some of these tools are really, really good. And they are allowing, as you are saying, to develop either new management strategies or new uh, pain control strategies that can actually be utilized by the industry. Yes. And I just also wanted to, to follow up and ask, what does our mindset have to be about investing in this type of research? Uh, the reason I say that is, uh, you know, there's obviously some legwork being done by the dairy industry right now in developing this type of technology. Uh, and, and we are really thinking about like future investment, right? It's not something that's a two or three, three year plan necessarily to be implemented, but a long-term vision for the beef industry and the way that technology will be involved in beef production 10, 20, 30 years from now. What kind of a mindset do we have to, uh, to adopt to be investing in that, that, that far down the road? Yeah, the way I see it is that, for example, with the use of antimicrobials, before they make the decision for us or for the industry, it is, will be better if we have the information readily available to better inform the decisions on whether what antimicrobials to use, when to use them, and, and how animals are actually being affected by not, not, not using them. So if we start looking at this information also with pain control during castration, if we have this more objective information available, the decisions that are gonna come in regarding these management practices are gonna be more truthful and more um, and better for the for the industry itself and for the animals as well. Um, so yeah, I would rather have information to handle the problem than rather trying to handle the problem without having all the information available. Great, wonderful, thanks. And we'll end on that note. Diego, on behalf of all the attendees, Beef Farmers of Ontario and the OVC in the University of Guelph, we really appreciate your time in putting together this review on this topic of, of precision livestock farming uh, and, and its application to the beef industry. And we look forward to seeing the results from all of your work in this area. Yeah, so, I'm glad my thank pleasure. You. I'm very happy to contribute um, to this experience this week. And, and yeah, very happy to entertain any questions. You have there my email and if you have any questions about it. And yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Great. Thanks, everybody. Take care and have a good night. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.